right, Dolores, you're very welcome to Capricorn TV. What an awesome day I'm having learning about your work. Um, okay. I think the first thing is on the hypnosis. You were talking about some uh, holistic type of hypnotherapy. Could you just briefly describe that uh, and why that's so important to your impression? Well, the normal TV, I mean the normal hypnosis, they don't do the type work that I do. Some of them do past life regressions, but they don't go all the rest of the way and get the healing. My method, we have found how to have instant healing in one session. It's very powerful technique that every illness, every disease, every physical ailment can be healed in one session instantly. That's why it's different than the normal hypnosis out there. They don't even approach what we have learned to do. Is it more difficult to do or is it just difficult? It's very, very simple, very easy. And over 45 years, I've developed it to where it is a simple method. It's not complicated at all. The other methods, the old methods, are much more complicated and they don't accomplish anything. You gravitated into this because of the, the regression model. Well, after my husband died and we, well, while he was living even, we went into the uh, past life regression. I've been doing that all along. Then it just developed into this other method. It's been a gradual thing, but it happened after all these other, other incidents happened. So you said that there's the same information coming through from hundreds of people on all the regressions that you've done. At what point did you realize there's something to all this, that there's a pattern? Uh, you must have been in shock and awe that this was being repeatedly told. No, I never go into shock and awe. I'm uh, always curious. Curious? Yes, because when it begins to happen, I see a pattern right away. And I know what's happening. I said, we're repeating something and we're getting more same information. That's when I put that down and then I know some more will come soon, and it always comes right after that, some more information about the same subject. But I'm not in awe of it, it's just, wow, look what I've found now. It's like a realization of an importance or significance, perhaps? Well, I guess, it's just like, look what I discovered. And that part is interesting. Because I'm the reporter, the investigator, the researcher of lost knowledge. So if I can find something that nobody knows or it's been lost or buried and forgotten, that's my job is to bring it back. You're very humble. You have wrote 13 books and traveled, I believe, you told me this morning, 2 million miles. That's pretty powerful in your career. Yes, 2 million miles. I have 17 books in print. Oh, and I'm, the 18th is ready to go to press. Wow. I've written, I'm working on three more. Wow. Can you hold up a copy of your uh, most recent book? Yeah, that's one of the last ones I've written. Can you just tell us a little synopsis of that? Just a very, very brief. If you well, can. that deals with the three waves of volunteers who are the people that have volunteered to come into the earth at this time to help save the earth from their energy. Their energy is pure, so they're springing in a special kind of energy that will help change the world, and that's why they're here. And people all over the world, we get tons of emails, and they're always saying, that's how I feel. And I didn't think anybody else in the world felt that way. They felt they were all alone. You, admittedly, in the last four years, it's been massive changes over the years for me, being in the midst of this and, and, and helped. I, I think a lot of people that come to your conferences and read your books would be looking for awareness. Would that be the one thing you wanted to take away? We are making a difference. Things are changing. And I have great hope for the world because I see what's happening everywhere. And it's a very important time to be alive right now. You were talking in uh, the workshop about um, there is no good or evil. Where does Satan fit into all this? This is the one that I. There own. is no Satan. Creation? You talk about Satan. Yeah. There is no Satan. This is man playing out with his... There is no devil, there is no Satan. What you're talking about is Lucifer. Yeah. Lucifer is a, is a, was an angel. Mm -hmm. 
according to the stories. But no, there's no evil forces at all. That's what people have to get away from. The church is the one to have created all of that to make people afraid. I've always personally thought that life is a test and I'm trying to better myself. And I, I always kind of, you know, I throw it back to key decisions that I make in my life. And they're like, do you think they're like noble points that you... you know, well, that's what life is all about. Learning lessons and having experiences. So it's constantly making decisions and hoping you're going to make the right one. Do you think perhaps the timeline at the start point and the finish point is guaranteed? It's just the, these nodal points could change in between these key decisions. You mean of your life? Yeah. Well, you know when you come to Earth, you make a plan of when you're going to leave. You also make plans of the different events that will occur along the way if you take advantage of them. If you don't, your life could take another path and be totally different. It's all about crossroads, all about paths. Which one do you go down? I believe in UFOs, I believe in souls and other dimensions and other galaxies that we come and we, we go and, and we reincarnate. But if I wanted to remember, can I, do I have that in me as an ability to remember? Or is it just something that would either happen? They, with the hypnosis and the past life regressions, you can remember. Is there any other way that would naturally happen or spontaneous? Maybe through meditation. If you learn how to meditate and quiet your mind, you might be able to remember. Is it important to the soul on this planet that we do remember? Or Not really. It's just a, a matter of choice? It's a curiosity of humans. Because they, the ones I work with, have said it doesn't matter anymore. If you dwell, think about the past, you're dwelling in the past. So as they said, think about now and moving forward, not on what you had done that you wish you hadn't done in other lives. So we're not supposed to worry about that. We're supposed to just move on and think about now. So not really that important if you find out what you did or not. Uh, you talk about the wheel of karma. If somebody wants to get off that wheel of karma and try to progress, what's the best way to do that? Forgive. Something I have trouble with. <laughs> I'm glad I asked that. They have to forgive those that they have harmed and then to forgive themselves because it always takes two in every situation. They forget about that. To forget, uh, forgive everyone who they think has harmed them, not carry that forward, let it go, let it go, it doesn't matter, it's not important. And then to forgive themselves for the part they played in the situation. You see metaphysics and modern age, quantum physics blending in now, do you have hope for... Uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. There is not no difference. Science, for some physicists it's not. For that. Well, the physicists are agreeing with me. Yeah. I get emails from them and they say, you are rewriting uh, physicists. Wow. How do you pronounce Physi that? Yeah, physics. physics. They said, you're rewriting it. You're making it where everybody can understand it now. It's all connected. Science separates it, but there is no, no separation, really. You also talk about consciousness of self. Is how important is cellular memory? Is it, is it cellular memory just for the body. Uh, okay, so that's all my questions. I do want to mention the, the cruise that you're going on, the Holy Land cruise. Uh, why the Holy Land cruise, I'd say? Is it something you love to do? Is it the setting? The well, we, two years ago we did an... Um, um, Mediterranean cruise and we went to most of these same ports. This time we wanted to go to ports that we hadn't gone to before. We thought well we hadn't been to Jerusalem and Israel so throw that in because it's people, things that people want to see. But now we're a little worried about it because they're having the uh, problems over there. Sure. But they said if they can't go there because they won't go there if there's any hint of danger they will put in some other ports to go to. But we're calling it the Holy Land Cruise because we've never been to Israel before. Wow, and of course the Holy Land Cruise is on October 25th to November 5th, 2014, featuring Robert Govan, yourself, Dolores Cannon, and Haktan Akdogan, I think his name is. He's from Istanbul, and Guy Needler is from England, from London, he's coming. I've had uh, Guy Needler on the show, lovely guy, and, uh, 
And Maria Wheatley is another English author who's going to be on the cruise. And who's our regular Capricorn? Okay. Wow, fascinating. Okay, listen, Dolores, I really thank you for your time today. I know you've had a long day, so <sighs> I really appreciate your time. to get the heat regulated because she was dripping wet up here. So we try to get all the windows open. Okay, you want me to test this? Is it working okay? Okay, good. I'll probably take his jacket off in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Well, I've written 17 books, and at lectures I can talk about so many things. I have tons of information. But they said they wanted me to focus today on reincarnation of past lives. Wasn't that what it was? Whoever's the boss. Are you the boss? <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> otherwise I can go off into so many other categories. And we'll have questions and answers, and if people want to go off into the other parts, you can do that. But if we want to focus on the reincarnation, past lives, and what happens when you die, and what it's like on the other side. There's a whole lot of material in all of that, if that's okay. Okay, well, I know most of you know who I am. Is that true? Is there anybody here who don't know, doesn't know me? Good, good. For about the last five years when I've been giving my lectures, things have been changing in the audience. Used to be, you know, everybody knew me. And now we have an audience where we fill auditoriums in some places. And people are always saying, we didn't know who you were. We just found you last week. And I said, I haven't been hiding. <laughs> I've been doing this work for 45 years. And my books have been out for over 30 years. So I haven't been hiding. Well, what's happening, it's the internet generation. And most of it is these young people are finally beginning to discover metaphysics and discover psychic things. To them, it comes very natural and very easy. So that's where things are changing now, and I think it's for the good that that's happening. Because, I mean, I've had to watch this evolve. When I began 45 years ago, nobody was doing any of this. That's why they called me the pioneer in the beginning of reincarnation, past life regression. When I began in the 60s, such a thing did not exist. Metaphysics didn't exist. There was no new age. The majority of the Western world didn't know anything about past lives or reincarnation at all. Because when I started and we got into it by accident, if anything is ever an accident, oh, they thought I was working with the devil, having seances, speaking to the dead. We are speaking to the dead, but it's not the way they were saying. I got kicked out of the church. A whole lot of things happened in those days. How many of you read my first book, Five Lives Remembered? Not too many. So maybe I can go over a little bit about that. Uh, but that's how I can see how things have changed. But when I began, my husband was a Navy a veteran, 21 years in the Navy. And me and him were both doing hypnosis in those days, but hypnosis was only used for habits. Stop smoking, lose weight, and to relax. Nobody would have ever thought of using hypnosis in any other way. That's why I said I'm a pioneer in this. There were no books out on it, nothing. There was absolutely nothing to tell a hypnotist what to do 
if something like, if they would go into a past life, because there wasn't any such thing. But my husband had just come back from Vietnam, and we were stationed down in Texas on a Navy base. And we were trying to get our lives back to normal. Well, we were doing the hypnosis for habits, and a lot of the men who were being transferred to Vietnam, some of them were very nervous and scared, so we were doing hypnosis to try to calm them down and relax them. That's all we were doing. And then the doctor on the base called us and said he had a woman patient who had what he called nervous eating. She had kidney problems and high pressure, problem, pressure blood, blood problems because of overeating. And he said, if you can just get her, she was very overweight, just get her to relax, that's all I want you to do. So during the process of getting her to relax, she jumped into a past life. In the Roaring Twenties in Chicago, with the flappers and the gangs, and it's like, what's going on here? Now I had heard of past lives, it wasn't totally new to me but we've never experienced anything. And a lot of people said they would have just stopped it, shut it down right there because this is too weird, too strange. But my trademark is curiosity. I'm curious. I always want to know everything about everything. So instead of getting frightened, I just want to know more. So we continued working with this woman. And we did it in our house, and it was all recorded on the portable tape recorder of the day. Things not big, so portable you couldn't even lift the thing. If you see the old reel to reel, I've still got it. That's what they were taped on. And you have to, we had to do it at our house. You couldn't hardly take it anywhere else. Well, we kept having these sessions. She was getting better, but we were curious. We wanted to know, what have we stumbled in here? And so she began to go through other lifetimes. And then we began to find out about between lives. We're speaking to somebody who's dead. Well, we were so fascinated by this that we tried to keep the woman anonymous, but the people on the, my husband's uh, friends on the base, other sailors, began to hear what we were doing. They came to the house and wanted to hear the tape recording. A lot of them had the totally wrong ideas, and that's where it began to spread around the base. We were having seances and stuff like that. Nobody understood what we were doing. You talk about past lives, they said, you're crazy. There, there's no such thing. That's where I began. But in the beginning of all of this, we just tried everything because there was nothing to tell you what you could do and what you couldn't do. So we were just experimenting. And in the middle of all of it, my husband was almost killed. He'd made it back from Vietnam fine, but he was on the way back from uh, going to work at the base one night and was hit by a drunken officer coming off of the base, head on collision and it was horrible. He really died three times that night. His entire lower body was totally crushed. He was in a Volkswagen bus. You know what those are. There's nothing in front of you. So you get the total impact of it, and he was ground into the metal. And um, whenever the helicopters came, they didn't have the jaws of life in those days. They had to try to pry the metal apart to get him out of there. So he was bleeding to death. The only thing that saved his life was in the car behind him was a corpsman who was just returning from Vietnam who knew how to handle trauma. Otherwise, he would have died. He knew what to do. So he was able to at least keep him alive long enough to get him to the hospital but he actually died three times. And the doctor said there was no way he could live, too much trauma, too much damage, and he had three brain concussions, his face was torn apart, plus all the damage to the lower legs. And they said if he did live, he would be a vegetable. 
because of the blood clots and the damage to the brain. So we didn't know what was going to happen. So they came and got me and took me to the hospital. We didn't know what to expect. But to, it sounded like a train when I was sitting back there. Is that what it means? <laughs> but let's back up a little bit. When we, can you hear me over that? Okay. When we were doing the experimenting, we didn't know what you could do. So I said, let's let her go into the future and see what we're going to be doing in the future. She saw us living where we live now. We live in the country on top of a mountain in Arkansas, very isolated. Believe me, I need that. I'm traveling all the time. I'm around people all the time. That's my refuge, my retreat, where I recharge my battery. But she saw us living, we had a big family, living on this mountaintop with, out in the country. So that night, when they came and got me and took me to the hospital, I was sitting there while five doctors, one after the other, came out talking to me, saying there's no way he can live. There's just too much damage. You've got to be prepared for that. He's probably going to die during the middle of the night. We aren't even going to try to do anything because it's hopeless. And I kept telling them, you're wrong. I couldn't tell them how I knew. They already thought me, the other ones thought we were crazy enough. I couldn't tell them how I knew, but I knew if she saw us in the future, we weren't going to die. He wasn't going to die that night. So they kept trying to convince me, and I said, no, you're wrong. So finally they said, well, if you really believe that, maybe he'll be okay. As it was, they began calling him the miracle man. He overcame every obstacle that she wasn't supposed to overcome. By the next day, his body began to go back by itself. His face, even, they thought they were going to have to do several plastic surgery on his face. It all went back with no sign that anything had ever been done. Now, he was really unconscious the most of the time he was in there. And they kept coming in and saying, he's a miracle man. And finally, when they saw he was going to live, then they started working on him. Now, he was in a body cast for eight months. I used to wonder, what would that be like to go eight months and not be able to move? It was pretty horrible. He was in the hospital for a year. But um, the whole thing was just unheard of. But anyway, the town really reacted. When this happened to him, they were all saying, this is God punishing you. Mm. Look what you're into. Reincarnation, past lives, peeking around hidden corners, looking at things you're not supposed to be looking at. God's punishing you. And I couldn't believe that because I knew God wasn't going to punish you for just asking questions and wanting to have information and knowledge. Besides the God we had discovered when we were doing the work was such a God of love that I knew that wasn't going to happen. It's funny, everything I found 45 years ago, I'm still finding the same information. I've written several books on it. The information has never changed. So we had truth back then, even though nobody knew what it was, it's still the same information I'm getting today through thousands and thousands and thousands of clients. It has not changed about the afterlife and what happens. So we had truth. When it's truth, I think it's repeatable. I think anything that is repeatable, it's like a scientific experiment. If you can repeat the same experiment over and over again, then it has validity. That's the way I believe, and I think that should be truth. So we have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt now with all of the cases I've done and all the classes I've given that we have discovered the truth. We've never found anything contradictory of what I've discovered back then. 
But um, anyway, he eventually was put out of the service as a disabled veteran, and we did move to the hills of Arkansas. We had to go somewhere where you could live with a big family and no money. Arkansas was a perfect place. And we spent years just barely making it. But he was in a wheelchair for 25 years. He could get around on crutches outside, but the majority of the time he was in the wheelchair. And it was during that time, I began to think a lot about what we had discovered. I wanted to continue hypnosis, but not the old methods, the same old stuff. I wanted to go back into the time travel that we had discovered. That's what I call it. We're going through time tunnels. We're discovering things in time. And when you do that, you're there in time, and you're getting the research, you're getting the information from the people these things happen to. That's what I wanted to do. Incidentally, we're making a movie on that first book. Five Life Remembered. I don't know what they're gonna call it, but they said it's such a fantastic story. They, it's about the beginnings, it's about that time era, the mindset in that time era. But I wanted to get back into this, but there was nothing being taught about it. It was still the same old, same old hypnosis. Even in the 70s, there was very little being done. The only thing I could find at that time was they were using visualization and imagery. So I began to study that and to apply it. But see, because there was nothing out there, I had to invent my own technique. <coughs> That's why it's so different than any other hypnosis technique because nobody taught me what to do. I had to find it out from years of, what would happen if I change this? What would happen if I throw this out and add something new? It was years and years of trying and perfecting it to where now we have something that is very teachable. But it took years to do that. So, it was many years before I finally began to do it again in the 70s. I had to wait till the kids were grown, they were getting married, going off to college. Then it's, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? <laughs> I decided what I wanted to do was not what the typical mother wanted to do. I wanted to time travel. I wanted to explore history. So, I decided to do that. And the amazing thing is in the hills of Arkansas, People came to me. I don't ever know how they found me, but they did. So my first books are about history. The Jesus material is some of the first books I ever wrote. And I have several other ones that were about history. So that's what I was doing during all that time was this exploring. And it was up in the 80s before anybody began even thinking, wow, past lives, maybe there's something to that. It took me nine years to get my first book published. Nine years of heartbreak. I've been through everything an author could be gone through. Every type of rejection, everything that could possibly happen to an author. I speak at writers' conferences now. I said, you don't have a clue how hard it is. I had to wait for the rest of the world to catch up with me. <laughs> you send it off to a publisher, past lives, reincarnation, what are you talking about? They didn't believe it. So I had to wait till the rest of the world caught up with me. And it was in the 1980s when one of the first ones was my publisher right here in England decided to take a chance on me and publish the Jesus books. He said, I don't know if they'll be accepted or not because of the way the information was obtained. But he took a chance and published them. They've been in print ever since. Over 20 languages all over the world. And that was one of the first books I wrote. And I have other, some of the other ones. But uh, it all began with the history. Then I was going along with that part when they asked me to become a UFO investigator, and that was in the 80s. And they said, you've been involved in the bazaar for so long, 
We don't think you'd be frightened if we asked you to come into the UFO community. He said, no, I'm just curious. I always want to know more. So it wouldn't bother me at all if that's what you want me to explore. So I began doing that, and I've been doing UFO investigations for 27 years. I've investigated the crop circles for, oh, since the 90s, when I first started coming over here. So I've been involved in the unusual, the weird, and the strange for a long time. But to me, that is the most exciting, finding new information, lost information, information nobody knows or it's buried and has never been found. To me, that's the most exciting part of my work. But I began, kept it up and kept it up, and writing more books and seeing thousands of clients when something began to happen. And this is the part that Julia was doing with her drawing when I discovered them. And once I discovered them, the whole thing changed because they began coming in on their own into my sessions and giving information. And they're the ones that was doing the instant healing. And I knew I'd found something, but then I found it was repeatable. And I found, everybody says, what, what do you think the first time it happened? It was gradual. They're always gradual and subtle. And it was so gradual that I didn't realize what was happening until I found out I could contact them through anybody I was working with. So now that's what I'm teaching is how to contact them and let them come through and heal the person. And they have the answer to anything you'd want to know. This is where my books, The Coming the Universe, come from. They said, all you have to do is ask a question and you can have any information you want. So that's the way it was going gradually. And now I've trained over 5,000 people all over the world. We're traveling all the time to all, is it more than that or not? It is now, but the online, everything you said, it was about that many. She's sitting there shaking her head, I don't know. I know it's a lot anyway, but they're all finding out they can do the same miracles that I have. And so that's my mission now is to get the healing information out, teaching that technique. So we're still doing it online, but when I began there was nothing. And I've watched everything evolve. Even 10 years ago, there wasn't that many people in, interested in metaphysics. They didn't know what you meant. You talk about the psychic or a medium, then it's always woo, woo weird. But now it's being more and more accepted than it used to be. So I watched it evolve slowly. And now with the new internet generation, I could really see a breakthrough. We are reaching the young people, and to them this is very normal and natural. Okay, so that's where I'm at at this time. And we are um, starting a university in Arkansas that's going to be on um, metaphysical studies and also we're gonna be teaching every phase of natural healing and alternative medicine areas. Because they told us to do this. And you always do what they tell you to do. Now how it's going to happen, but they always tell you, just do what we tell you to do. And they said, my work will be the cornerstone of the university, but we're going to teach everything that anybody could possibly want to know. So that's where we're at now. We're in that project, in the movie projects. There's going to be TV series based on my work. So I have to stop these long overseas trips because I've got to be focused at home on these other things. So the people seem saying, when are you going to quit? I'm not about to quit, it's just changing focus. There's a whole lot more things going on in my life. Okay, so that's how you've got my history now. Let's go into your history, the history of your soul. Okay. 
This is all information that I've accumulated over many, many years. Many times in my work, I will get a piece of information from one client. And a week later, maybe on the other side of the world, we get a piece of information from another client. Yeah, we'll hook it together. They say, we've got some more information for you, and it will flesh out the whole theory or concept. So it doesn't come through just one person. It comes through many, many different people. My job as a researcher, the reporter, investigator, is to put it all together like a gigantic puzzle. So, part of it has been put together in the book of Between Death and Life, and in other books we have more pieces of it. Okay, but I have people coming up and to meet my clients saying, what's my home planet? Where am I from? You don't have a home planet. You may have lived on another planet, but you don't have any planet that you come from. And that's what some of them don't understand. They want me to process that out. I always know what they're going to say anyway. But you do not have a home planet. You may have lived on other planets. All of you have. We live, you've lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes. Every shape, form you could possibly imagine and some you cannot imagine. Because every life has a different lesson and experience it's trying to show you. So you, you have had lives before you came to Earth on other planets, other dimensions, where you've learned a lot of valuable information. But that's not who you are. You began long, long before that. After you complete your Earth school, then you may decide, I want to go to another planet and try the school there. So you're not done even when you finish Earth. That's what's so funny. You know, it's, this is nothing but a school. That's all it is. You don't get out till you graduate. You fail a grade, you've got to take that grade over again. People would just get that through their head. Yes, I tell them, you know you're going to have to come back and do it again. I don't want to do that. And I said, you better work it out now. Or you have to. It's the law of karma. You're all on the wheel of karma. But no, you did not come from any certain planet or any certain dimension. We all began at the same time with God. They always called him the source. Everything began with the source, with God. I've had so many people go back to God that we know what he, is, what he is and what he looks like, and it's tremendous. They always see it as a huge bright light, a huge energy source. And they said, when they're in it, it's like being in the sun, but it's not hot. But the, when they're in, with, back with God, it is just total love. You have never felt anything like that in your life. It's total love that you cannot even describe. It is so beautiful and wonderful. I had one woman who went back there and she said she forced she would like to go back home. They always say, when you go there, they say, I'm home, I'm home. She wanted to see what it was like, so she got it. And afterwards, she was crying and crying because it was so beautiful. Once they see it, they don't want to leave. It is so extremely beautiful and full of love. And afterwards, the SC is what I call it. The subconscious part is the one that communicates and talks to us. I call it the subconscious, even though it's not like the subconscious that the psychiatrist defined. That's a childish part of your mind. But I didn't know what to call it, so I called it the subconscious. They said, we don't care what you call us. We don't have a name anyway. We'll work with you. But we wanted to know why it showed her that. And they said she wanted to see it, but we just gave her a taste of it. If we showed her what it was really like, she would not want to come back into this body. That's how tremendous it is. Total love. 
And when they're there, they don't want to leave. Everybody is together. And that's where we all started. We were all one with God. A huge energy mass. But God became curious. He wanted to know more. So the way he did this, he burst out. Now, some people call it the Big Bang Theory. He burst out into millions and millions of pieces, little tiny dots of light. Some of these dots of light became galaxies. Some of them became planets. Some of them became universes. But the majority were your own individual little souls. When I take people back to what they really, really are, all they see is a tiny little speck of light. That's what you really are. That's your soul, is a tiny speck of light. They shot out in all directions. And God said, go, my children, and learn. Learn everything there is to learn. Have every experience there is to have. Then bring it back to me. And I asked them one time, well, what does God do with all this information once we bring it back? He creates other universes. He creates more. It seems to be the main thing is to gather information and then to bring it back to God. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we see is like in a gigantic computer. And it's all adding information to the source. So you go back, it's all dumped into this gigantic computer. Does this make sense? Because sometimes people think this is kind of a out of the way explanation for it, but it, to me it makes perfect sense of how you all began. But God is total love. And that's where you all began. Started on your journeys. You all went different directions. And some people went to other planets, some people went to other dimensions. Some people decided to take on Earth school, which you are right now. Your soul decided to do Earth school. Earth is the most difficult planet in the universe. The hardest, densest, heaviest planet to live on. I, I really don't like it when I say this, but they say we're the bottom feeders. That's how dense the energy is here. The bottom of the barrel. And she said, I don't like you to say that. But they say, when you decide you're going to go to Earth, they're very proud of you. Because they know what you're going to take on. They know how difficult it's going to be. It's not going to be an easy task. And they always say, are you really sure you want to do this? And he said, yeah, I think I'm going to take on the Earth School. It sounds like it'd be interesting. But it's the most difficult you could possibly ever take on. But you decided you wanted to do it. Life is all about experiences and lessons. That's all it is. And many people have bad, everybody has bad things that happen in their life. But what did you learn from it? If you learned one thing, that was the reason for you having that lifetime and that lesson. That's all it was for, was that one little thing. But some people, my clients, will say, well, I didn't learn anything, it was just a horrible experience. Then guess what? You gotta do it again. You didn't learn anything, you gotta do it again. Same people, same situation. That's the law of karma. You don't get out of anything. You don't learn it, you take it a class again. So, you all decided you want to take on Earth School. And believe me, they're trying to talk you out of it on the other side. Do you realize what you're signing on for? It's going to be so hard. 
And they said, yeah, I want to do it, I want to do it. They said, all right, we will be there to help you, but it's not going to be easy. Because the Earth School is a long school. Once you sign on for it, you don't get out until you have completed the whole school by going to college. You don't get out of it. You can take the same. They said, we don't care how many times you want to take that class over. Doesn't matter to us, but you want to take the same experience for eternity? Or when are you going to get it? When are you going to learn it? It's up to you. Otherwise, you can just keep spinning around and around doing the same thing over and over again. Doesn't matter to them. You have eternity to learn even just one lesson. But do you want to take eternity? Or do you want to learn it and move on when you can get out of it? Because when you get out of it, then you go back to God, or you go to another planet to learn their lessons. Every planet has different lessons, different rules and regulations. Earth is very, very unique. There are many things about Earth that are nowhere else in the universe. And that's what makes us very different. But when you sign on for the Earth School, it's a long school. You don't just sign on and become a human. That's the last thing you do. You have a lot of other lifetimes you have to experience before you become human. Because everything has something to learn. It just doesn't suddenly pop into a human being. Uh, the first thing you would have to do, I'm doing it linear, even though they say time doesn't exist, I'm putting it in a linear fashion. I think it's easier to our minds to understand it that way. Now all of these things I discovered over the 35 years, I get one and I get another and I said, what's going on here? But then I began to see patterns forming in all of this. First you have to know what it's like to be air gas, air. This will show you everything is alive. Everything has consciousness. They said one of the biggest lessons I could teach anyone is that everything has consciousness. Everything is alive. But first you have to be air, gas. One of the first uh, sessions I ever had that established that was a man went back to, to Earth in the beginning of his a formation when the volcanoes were still erupting, the lava was flowing, and there was all this gunk in the air. There was all the sulfur and ammonia in the air. Life couldn't form yet, even plant life, because the, the atmosphere wasn't right. It had to be corrupted. So this man went back to who would be part of the atmosphere. And his job, along with many others, was to help clean the ammonia out of the atmosphere so that life could begin to develop. So see, he had an important job, even though we wouldn't, I said, he's like a gas and I'm talking to him, he has intelligence, he's answering me. But now I know, they, I knew this all the time, but in the beginning it was like, what is this? But. You, everything has an importance, it all has a job. I've had many people go back to when they were the water. And there was one there at the beginning of life on Earth where they had to form the very first drops of water by condensing them out of the atmosphere. The drop by drop by drop eventually became pools of water, then it became rivers, and it became the oceans. So everything has importance. Okay, first you have to be air, gas. Then you have to be rocks and dirt. You don't know how many people I've had to be rocks. And when they're a rock, they'll say, life is so slow. <laughs> it takes a long time. I had one woman went back to when she was a rock, and afterwards I always asked the SC, why did you show that to them? And they said, she thinks she doesn't have any freedom now. 
imagine what life was like when she was a rock. But those kind of lives, they can hardly wait to get out of there and try something new and different. The same with the dirt, everything is alive. I had a businessman who was part of the dirt, and he's watching all the little bugs and worms crawling around. But you have to know what these things are like. Then after that, you have to become plants. And I've had people, they don't realize all these things are alive and you have all been there. Think how much differently you would treat nature and our ecology and the environment if you realize I've been that. I'm just harming myself. If they understood that, they don't understand that it's not two separate things here, it's all us. So, we've had people be plants. Imagine what it would be like to be an ear of corn. I've had people do that, and they're fine, except a cow may come along and eat you. <laughs> uh, one person said it was so beautiful to be a rose, but that life didn't last very long because the rose wilted. But we've all known what it was like to be plants in one way or the other, to what it would feel like to be a blade of grass. I've had many, many be trees. They love being trees. One was a redwood tree. You know, in the States, those are the oldest trees in the world. And he was part of that for it seems like forever. And he had his whole family, all the other trees were their family. But you know, eventually, even a tree that old will eventually die. But he lived the whole life experiencing what it was like to be a tree and have the camaraderie of all the other trees around him. And I found out that all the trees can communicate with each other. It's like a mind to mind. They will communicate to each other. All the plants will too. Maybe this will put you thinking in a different direction. But then you're going to have to know what is it like to be an animal? See the progression? What we think is something dumb and unintelligent, it actually has much more intelligence than you think it does as it progresses upward. You, what would it be like to be an animal? What would it be like to be a wolf and run? What would it be like to be a bird and fly? I've had people be all of these things. And when I get somebody as an animal, I want to know what is that like? How does that animal think? How does it feel? What's different about that animal, that insect, that is different than us? I've had people be spiders and ants. And you know, spiders and ants both have a lot of eyes. And I said, I asked them, how can you see? And they say, well, imagine looking at a, a department store where you have all these TV sets. And when you see movement, you focus on that one and shut out the others. That's how they see. But they're able to do that, the fly, the same way it has a faceted eye. They focus on movement in that one part and see that. <coughs> these, a lot of these things I don't think the scientists have ever known. But I've had many be bugs and worms and uh, spiders and ants. They're quite remarkable creatures. And bees. But you've all been there, done that. You've lived that life. But I think one of the most fascinating is the birds. I had somebody be an eagle. And they were perched on a, a mountaintop. He had a nest there with a little baby chick in the nest. And he was peering out over the valley below. And I wanted to know, how do you see? Because you know a lot of these birds hunt at night. 
like the owls. I want to know how you see. They said, let's make sure I get this right, they're looking out at the 